Okay, so feel free to ooh and ah. I will enjoy that. Clap. If you see something you like, that's fine. That would be fun. Um, so I'm going to talk about typographic uh, and printing renegades. It's a small exploration of the artistic printing movement and the type designers that were a part of this wild and rebellious landscape from the mid-19th century to the early 20th century. I use the term renegade because many artists and purists during and after this time period felt that the designs produced were over the top or garish and used, and more specifically, that type was used incorrectly. So to add to the fussiness, of the designs were ornamental borders and motifs designed along with the typefaces. And these represented popular culture patterns with Asian, Egyptian, botanical, and architectural flair. I'll talk about and show examples of the work created by these rebels. Um, Herman Eilenberg is the type designer I'll focus on the most. Um, his work that I'm going to show you is from his personal papers collection that is housed at the Carey Collection at RIT in Rochester, New York. His work was meticulous, it was detailed, and I think it was beautiful. I see these early renegades as having greatly influenced the type and design landscape of today, which speaks to the beauty of the work and the longevity of a style that was looked upon at times with disdain. Yet still, it persists within our typographic and visual canon of today. So just a little background, a little historic background. So the Victorian time period was considered modern due to its many different in inventions of steam power, printing technology, and photography. Steam power enabled the growth of factories and production of goods. More goods meant designing advertisements for the goods, as well as packaging and new ways to print the packaging. Another aspect of this time was the creation also of or the, what became the middle class, which was made up of managers of factories for these packaged pr products, bankers and lawyers, and more disposable money to purchase goods. The middle class were also influencing the landscape in terms of building Victorian homes with a lot of decorative trim and ironwork and interiors that showed off their stuff and moving out of the cities into what was considered suburbs. So as well, women's clothing was also accentuated with busts, with busts and bustles, lace and ribbons, and it also showed off their stuff more. So things during this time were being designed with a universal theme of over-accentuation. So it makes sense that we begin to see this in the advertisements of ephemera of the time. Colors were being introduced, bright pops of color to grab attention. Swash ornaments were used and designed and paired up with type. And also it would add another level of interest. Architectural details were also added to the page. So you'd see a lot more type on a curve, encapsulated type um, within a pattern square, um, borders were added. And like the women's clothing of the time, typefaces were pushed and pulled and tightened and inflated. So all of the type um, and ornaments were hand-drawn before being cast in metal. So adding many different typefaces to one ad was becoming the norm, and it was used in such a way to designate the importance of each chunk of text. And clearly all of the text was important. Sometimes the swashes of type were used to enhance imagery or direct the eye, point things out, or enhance meaning and emulate movement. Type was becoming stylized to fit with themes and to add interest to a product, perhaps as something that seemed mundane, to make everyday objects more interesting. So you would try and make an automatic pencil more interesting, or thinking about smoking tobacco and making that more interesting. Any ooze yet? This is a drawing from Herman Eilenberg's scrapbook and sketchbooks. He was born in Berlin, Germany in 1843. He was trained in painting and drawing and was extremely grounded and proficient in these skills. Here, you, was there a wow? Yeah, thanks. I know, 
right? So he apprenticed as a punch cutter for type foundries in Berlin first, Frankfurt, Prague, and then Paris. Within his work, the attention to detail is phenomenal. His work and tonal quality emulates ornate architectural stonework like these examples. And this is all done, the example on the left is in pen, um, ink, and the example on the right is pencil. Thank you. <laughs> in 1866, he immigrated to the United States and he worked for McKellar, Smiths, and Jordan, which later became American Type Foundry or part of American Type Foundry, where he designed type, borders, and ornaments. By 1898, he had drawn and cut approximately 80 alphabets of more than 3,000 sizes and 31 borders. He's best known for his typefaces being extremely or ornamental, as you can see here. And he admired the work of lithographers and preferred drawn type designs and followed more of a lithographic style with his drawings. Not all of his typefaces were cast in metal, but there are hundreds of drawings, and this is just, these are just three pages from a bunch of chunks of sketchbooks that he has or had. Um, many of his typeface designs that were patented used aspects from these drawings, so I was able to see the patented designs and then kind of pull um, characteristics or little traits from these that he was using. Um, so I, um, for instance, phylum, which is, I think it's phylum, on the top left, was, did become filigree, or aspects of phylum became a patented uh, typeface, which is called filigree. Anything? Okay, I hear a couple. Okay, so Island Brook kept sketchbooks, or scrapbooks, where he would cut out interesting labels and ads, and this is actually an example from that. This is one of his scrapbook pages. So he would cut out ads, um, and he would use these to help keep up with what was going on at the time, the current trends, if you will. He would draw his type and ornaments based off of what was popular in printed work, um, and he excelled at creating these borders, which you see here. They weren't very popular at first, the borders, because people didn't know really how to use them. And once they were shown by printers how to be used, then they became much more popular. Um, Eilenberg created the most famous and best-selling ornamental styles of type, borders, and ornaments of the time. Here is a couple examples of the patented uh, typefaces. So we have filigree and italic copper plate. Um, this was uh, put out by McKellar, Smiths, and Jordan. And uh, it was, they produced some of the most original typefaces of the time period. Here's patents for Nymphic and Zinco. Um, another thing that shows up in Eilenberg's work is that he favored decorative swashes and encapsulated letters. Um, they're similar styles to the 15th and 16th eliminated manuscript letters. Um, he was also very fond of three-dimensional letters that appear to be kind of popping out of the page. Um, so, with McKellar, um, McKellar, Smith, and Jordan, they were considered a distinctly an American school of design. Their type was considered that. So some of the commentary that was being said at the time about it was that it was liberty run mad, and this was being said a lot of times in Europe, liberty run mad, or it was a style that had no style. So many of the type designers of this time had immigrated to the US from Germany and Scotland, where the tradition of fine craftsmanship and faithfulness to detail was very important. So as well as a knowledge of fine hand lettering. Henry Bremer was um, a peer of Eilenberg's, and he was from Germany as well. These are some examples of his work. Kleptom it's Edith, Kleptomania, and Alma, which is also crayonette. He had designed crayonette for another type foundry and then designed Alma, um, which is the exact same typeface for a different type foundry. Um, so he designed typefaces for James Connor's sons, George Bruce's sons and company, and Lindsay type foundry. Lindsay type foundry is a type foundry that he created Alma for and Edith. He did a lot of female named typefaces for Lindsay. Um, Bramer's type designs were more condensed and they had much more thinner strokes. They were less decorative. Um, they used a bit more, they were used a little bit more in copy than they were in just a couple of words. 
And he also was very prolific which, with his borders and ornaments as well. So again, like I said before, a lot of people didn't understand how these ornament or these typefaces worked together until they were put together on a page. So a lot of times in specimen books, you would see the ornaments making, creating that actual border on the page so you could see how it could be utilized. Julius Harriet Sr. was another peer of Eilenberg's. Um, and he created type that, or I think some of the type designers at the time created typefaces that emulated a little bit of a nationalistic feel. feel. So you'll find that the German type designers at the time used a lot of black letter. Um, and so added decorative kind of swashes and motifs and small ornamental designs to those. So like Eilenberg, Harriet also designed letters that were encapsulated, but also used thinner lines and swashes as part of his type design. Um, Harriet's most popular designs were his word logotypes, which are all the way on the right, um, which he designed uh, as abbreviations of words or condensed the words together to make them one unit so when they were laid out on the page, it wouldn't take up as much space. And here's some more um, work from Harriet. So Julius Harriet also designed utility ornaments, but these were more of an illustrative kind of ornament rather than um, a decorative ornament. They actually were a picture of something. Um, so here's an example of Hermann Eilenberg's work in print. Um, so this is also a listing of the different typefaces that are shown in some of these ads. But I wanted to show this, I don't know if I can, all the way on the left, there are those little corner pieces. That's from Eilenberg's sketchbook, which I thought was kind of cool because he shows a lot of the, I guess it's crible. Is it crible? Yeah, so he shows a little bit of the crible, which I didn't know that term, so thank you. Um, <laughs> and he, it looks like it's being used then in this ad next to it. Um, so again, just some more ads that were used at the time with some of Eilenberg's work as well. And then also, this was um, these works were being produced by the American um, Printer Specimen Exchange. So it was produced by Edward McClure, which allowed, this is where the printers could be a little bit more renegade and rebellious. It allowed printers to print like throw everything onto the page and show off what they could do. So they could use all of their typefaces and they could use all of the inks and the technology that they had at the time and show people what, the, what could be done. So these are examples from that page. Um, Eilenberg's In Memoriam, that's one of his typefaces at the bottom. Um, we have black condensed or black ornamented number 523, which is the steam press printer typeface up at the top, it's Eilenberg. Printers is filigree. So again, you can kind of see that reference to the Illuminated Manuscript typefaces from the 15th and 16th century. But what I really like about this are the metallic, like that blue metallic-y, ooh. I didn't hear any oohs on that one. It might be harder to say. Um, so it's kind of fun to see these, these bright pops of color and metallic inks. Um, so the example in the middle for the Turner Levisay, Levisay, the writing inks, copying, and the example on the bottom, improved favorite, and the example on the right, the Board of Education, are actually Julius Harriet's typefaces. And that typeface, the Board of Education, is called Nero. Does it look like something like familiar to you guys? Does anybody know? There's a prize to be had if somebody answers this. Yeah, so, so I noticed that right away, and I was like, that's so weird. Except that they seem to, and you, I'll give you a prize. You can pick it out. Find me later. I have a little prize for you. Um, so it just seems like they kind of snipped off the little serifs a little bit um, from the original and made it a little bit, you know, just tweaked it, stylized it for the movie, but um, definitely a, a based off of Nero. Um, so what's, what's happening now? So I wanted to talk just a little bit about 21st century renegades or how this is being used in the 21st century with graphic designers, with type designers, and with printers. Um, so the first example, um, and it's just a small sampling. I know there's so many other names that I'm not going to even touch upon, and it's such a big um, conversation, this whole thing. So to, I'm kind of condensing it into 20 minutes. Um, but the first example is from Star Shaped Press. They're out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, again, using 
uh, ornaments and highly decorative types for her projects. Um, a lot of her work I see, especially at the bottom right, you know, reminds me of the example on the left where she builds everything out of type ornaments, or the example on the left here, which is an Eilenberg example. Um, Hammer Press Studio, which is out of Kansas City. Um, was there a woohoo? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice, nice. Um, which is, again, same thing, the Eilenberg references of building um, the page out of type ornaments, using the type ornaments to build the page. Um, thinking about why this is all, why this is coming back or hasn't totally gone away is kind of interesting to me too. What is it about this that people are you know, attracted to? I think when this first started coming back, letterpress, it, it was more precious, it was used as invitation design, right? That sort of thing, like special events. But now it feels like it's being used in more everyday things, in our packaging, our labels. I think we see it more um, in the landscape. Studio and Fire is one of my favorite studios. They're out of Minneapolis. Okay, nice, mini. So um, the top row are projects that they printed for, for designers, for design companies, studios. Um, and the bottom are projects that they have done in-house and then printed in-house as well. So again, I think these, these um, print shops and design studios are doing really cool things with um, playing with different types of printing technology, different types of inks, metallics, die cuts, um, shapes, that sort of thing. Uh, the, and the next two are Kevin Cantrell and Yield um, Studio. They do some nice work as well. This is Kevin Cantrell's I like um, because you, we start seeing this in the ads that were the way it was being used in the late 19th century. Um, so maybe I think in some ways ephemera is more important now than it used to be. I mean ephemera at the time of the late 19th century that was meant to just be put up and then just disappear. It wasn't meant to last. Um, and I don't know about you all, but I collect a lot of ephemera um, to the point where it reminds me of how much I drink because I have all these like wine bottles and beer bottles and I'm like, whoa, this might be a problem. But I collect a lot of this stuff because I think it's beautiful. I think some of it's really, really quite fantastic. Um, and I think there's something about uh, design and um, visuals and type that's, that stays with us, right? And we, we keep these things that weren't meant to, I mean, I have coasters like in bombs in my bags that are now like all crappy, but I still have them. Um, TPD Design House and um, also has done some interesting things with taking like or ornamental um, swashes and adding them to their, uh, their designs. And also Mama's Sauce, which is more of a print studio. Um, I like that, a little shimmery. Whoa, that was a good one. Oh, yeah. Do you want to play it again? Just think it. Oh. Ooh. Oh, I'm not going to touch it anymore, JP. Sorry. Um, so, anyway, we'll move on. Um, but anyway, Mama Sauce, they're out of Orlando, and they do a lot of um, crazy technical print stuff as well. Oh, no. Did I just mess it up? Oh, no. Okay. All right. Um, Doretta Rinaldi, again, um, you know, it's interesting for me because I'm really getting interested in the fourth dimension and motion and, and how type can start playing with, within that, that realm. Um, so again, adding these ornamental um, swashes and details into the work. So I guess one thing I want to, you know, just leave with is just like, well, what's next? Like, what's, what's going to be the next thing? Is this going to go away? Is it going to stay? Um, I think there's something beautiful about all of it um, and just in the details. And I hope it does stay. I'm really curious as to where it'll go next. So thank you.